Uh, again, again, I'm uh, Brendan Horn uh, on the Board of Health Consumers Queensland, and it's my job to um, introduce Natasha Molstrom from the North, uh, North uh, Metro North Hospital and Health Service, and she's going to give us a, an adder on, on outcomes of lived experience shared in domestic and family violence training. And Natasha is a skilled consumer representative, advisor, health advocate, educator, and lived experience practitioner. And she, she suggested that she'll be open to question, questions once she's finished her talk. I don't know how to work the clicker, so we'll see how I go forwards, forward, backwards, backwards. Yeah. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share my perceptions of the outcome of lived experience sharing in the domestic and family violence training. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this country, particularly where we meet today, and their relationship to land, wind, water and community. I pay my respect to them, their cultures and elders past, present and emerging. So power and passion. When I think firstly about those words and what they mean to me in my life and in my experience, particularly with domestic and family violence, my power had been taken from me. Everything I thought I knew about myself, relationships with society and culture had all been transformed into one where I must do, say and be whatever it was not to trigger the perpetrator. Hang on, I can't see. I became a victim and I wasn't aware of this. I wasn't aware until I realised I wasn't me anymore and I didn't know who me was. And this is where my passion kicked in. This presentation is focused on my personal commitment and actions towards changing culture through consumer collaboration and involvement in design, delivery and the evaluation of the domestic and family violence recommendations from the Not Now, Not Ever report, putting an end to domestic and family violence in Queensland. Just as a side note, when I was watching Nine up in Townsville here, May is actually Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Month, so seeing that ad was really quite profound for me to be speaking in this month as well. My involvement in the delivery of the recommendations was grounded within the experience of the victim and survivor, not only during their service engagement, but a behind the scenes perspective on how we process domestic violence in our lives and what we would have liked the service to have done in response and to support us during this time. Highlighting a person-centred care approach, citing connection, validation and respect was really important for me. When the opportunity to submit an expression of interest for the Domestic and Family Violence Expert Advisory Group with the Strategic Policy Unit <laughs> was presented to me, I just had my youngest daughter, you've probably heard her and, or seen her running around today. Um, she was six, eight weeks old at the time and I was in the middle of completing Lifelines training, which is rec recognise and respond appropriately to domestic and family violence. It had seemed that I had an opportunity to turn my experience into one of hope, growth and change. One that shows all four of my children that no matter what happens in your life, you can find your own purpose. I've chosen to stand tall, much like this flower, and share my experience and advocate for change, support others and strengthen community. Thank you. My children have their own experience of domestic and family violence now as well. And I hope that they never have to experience anything like that again. And I hope that my youngest daughter never has to experience that. And she lives in a world where she can be authentic and where she can be safe. I am a survivor. 
and a survivor is defined as someone who lives in circumstances where others have died. It's important for me to highlight that domestic and family violence services up here are available for everyone to access, but there are more supports available as well, and the local knowledge is so important if we're to offer a wraparound care and walk with someone supporting them, gently connecting them with the appropriate service in a way that is meaningful for that person. Can you guys read that or not really? Is it too small? Too small? Okay. So the national plan, sorry, it's a bit of the bureaucratic blah, blah first. Um, the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children 2020 indicates that victims of domestic and family violence are more likely to, dis to disclose that experience to a health professional. The way in which that health employee responds to this, this disclosure is critical to the victim's safety and support. Um, I won't read the other stuff, that's all right. So, the academic side of the training resource development um, was looked after by both the Queensland Health Strategic Policy Unit, the Domestic and Family expert advisory group, which had lots of community stakeholders. Um, we had the CEO of Mindblank DV Connect was on our board as well. We had PHNs there, so it was quite, you know, my little voice trying to, to bring everything else through as well. Um, and it was in, it, during that consultation, um, I, I was recommending that the literature featured information that acknowledged and educated the, uh, the diversity of participants. So it was really important for the cold community, the ATSI community, LGBTI. I certainly um, don't have that knowledge, but it was really important for me to say, hey, I don't know, but we need to include this stuff. You guys need to include it. Um, I suppose that's too small too. Um, so, responding to disclosure, well, can you hear me when I turn and do that or no? Where's that other mic? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is out of the uh, toolkit of resources. Um, so if you were to jump online and do the training um, through Queensland Health and their QEPS, whatever it is, this is one of the slides that'll come up and a couple will pop up. So whenever you're seeing this layout, it's from those toolkits. Um, so responding to disclosure, a supportive and professional response from healthcare providers can reinforce to a victim or survivor that they are entitled to a healthy relationship and to live a life free from violence. Focusing on the needs of the individual can be achieved through displaying empathy and non-judgmental attitude and offering privacy and confidentiality. It is important that health professionals respond in ways that support patient needs, particularly the need for safety. Seeing things like this after I'm saying we need these things in here, it's not about your literature, this is about connection. It's about the way that you're connecting and the way that you're, you're doing this with our, with our victims, with our survivors. I don't like those words, but they're the words I have to use. Um, so when I was preparing this speech, I went back through all of those slides and I was really trying to remember my contributions in those meetings and really trying to find them within the toolkits of resources. Seventy-one, seven, seven, five incidents are reported in Queensland, but 90% aren't. So I've got that at about 650,000 people that aren't reporting violence, if my maths is right, to, and to steal the joke from last night with the math stuff, I'm, I'm no good. I tried to work out the percentages and I thought, no, I better not do that, otherwise it might look a bit bogus. Um, and really, when I was playing with my calculator, 
It was how many people have to live with fear in their lives in a year. And this is just a year. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, psychological, economical threats, coercion. And I can't read the last bit. But they're all very um, profound. Domestic and family violence comes in many forms. And through doing um, training, through learning myself, um, you know, sometimes you just think that, 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 that it's a normal behaviour. You've grown up thinking that it's a normal behaviour um, when really it's, if I'm not feeling safe, if I'm not, if I'm not able to make the choices in my life that I want to make, then, then clearly that's not, um, that's not good. I just want to talk a little bit about attitudes um, and just touching on what I mentioned before. It highlights how, how deep conditioning of domestic and family violence could be because it's about conditioning. It's about what the family members, it's about what the community is saying. And, and when you grow up, when violence is, is predominant, when coercion and threats pull people into line, you, you think that's the norm. And when someone starts to challenge it, Oh, that's a, that's a big personal inquest. You know, you've got to dig deep to sit there and go, this is what I know, but someone else is telling me something different. That's, that's a huge internal conflict to, to work through within yourself. And, and that's something that, um, why it's so important to, to really connect. And, and, and you know, it's every, everyone's involvement, everyone... The more people that tell you that it's not okay, the more you start to believe that, okay, maybe it's not okay, and what I've been told is actually wrong. Um, so this one discusses that um, the gender roles and behaviours are learnt and reinforced in the earlier years. Um, a particular one for me, when I was first seeking help and was looking at the patriarchs in my family, there was victim blaming coming from my inside circle. It was my fault. Victim blaming is common and shifts the focus from the perpetrator accountability. Oh, Natasha, you're just expecting too much from them. That's what blokes are like. That's not, that's, that's not cool. Um, so there was challenges within my own family circle and it was really um, a community attitude and me reaching out that started to um, build that strength for me. So within the toolkit, we had some myths and facts. I really wish this would, you guys were able to read this. So it's my fault I put the slides together. Um, so it is a myth that women can always leave an abusive relationship if they wanted to. Um, anyone can leave an abusive relationship if they wanted to. Um, I won't go into the politics of <laughs> the gender stuff with that, but um, that's, it is a myth. Uh, and, and this one was really important and was highlighting the, the different diverse groups that specific population groups are more um, vulnerable. So it was really important to be able to have that highlighted to clinicians and people that were responding to domestic and family violence to know that you know, in, in a hospital system where we want everything to fit in the one box, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer for domestic and family violence. And it has to be, it has to be person-centred and you need to understand that context and what's going on in a person's life. Um, you know, to, to really... You know, it, it's, it's, just, it's about that connection. There, there were times when, when I... Um, Look, the first couple of times that I had health professionals sit there and tell me, I, I dismissed it. Like, to be, to be quite honest, I don't think you would have caught me in the first couple of goes. And I think it's the statistics about it takes eight times on average to leave a domestically violent relationship. So I was just like, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. He's just grumpy all the time or whatever else I said to, to justify the behaviour. Um, and... and Yes. Could you please clarify, firstly, could you 
Would you please give us a couple of reasons as to why it's not as easy as just leaving your relationship? Help us better understand so that when we're in these situations, we don't judge the conclusion that it's just easy to leave. Sure. Um, can potentially touch on that a little bit more later, but to answer you um, now, um, I still do some peer work now with, with some women that are experiencing violence, so sometimes it's um, pride, sometimes it's financially, I don't know if I can survive and have the same lifestyle as I used to, to go from um, having, one example is I have a FIFO husband, I'm used to three grand a week, I can't live on $500 single parent pension. So that's a huge, what, there's the financial barrier. Um, it's my understanding that culturally sometimes it's hard to leave you maybe shaming your family. Um, fear of being hurt, fear of being stalked. Um, sometimes it's better the devil you know. That's not necessarily true in this case, but I think there's a lot of people when it's a change and change can be scary and doing that alone and being alone if you don't have those supports in place, um, that's, like, it's scary. I spent some time um, in a shelter and looking at, I felt fairly well off being there when I was, put my analytical hat on and was looking at the other people there. Um, it was, Obviously, just like um, it was said this morning, I can't speak to, to what those, the same way those, speak, those people can and what their fears are, but um, sometimes it, it comes down to, I just really want to be loved and he loves me sometimes. And it, it's just that, that wanting to be loved and you stay with someone even if they're abusive because they love you. So there's that, it, it, it's breaking that down as well and that's, I find with the people that I support that that's, it's quite common that they just want to be loved and they want their family to be together and they don't want to separate it. So there's a, another barrier. But it, I guess it's um, listening to sort of the underlying themes where people sort of come through, like, uh, you know, ask questions about... Um, gosh. <laughs> I, I don't envy the health professionals for having to do this. I struggle at times to connect with people. I have my own connection to those things, so sometimes um, that can be... It's quite triggering as well. But I think barriers to someone leaving is, you know, as diverse as the people in the room. Everyone's going to have their own separate reason, and it's about building that connection and being able to... Um, you know, help someone work through those work through those barriers when they're ready. Hope that sort of cleared it up a little bit for now. Uh, even worse. Okay. Um, so the, bo the bottom two slides are an example of, we have the ATSI, culturally diverse, older people, people with disabilities, and the LGBTI community. And then we have a couple of little tips over here that I cannot read whatsoever. So um, this was just highlighting the ATSI one, and of course, it, uh, yeah, it would sort of flow down um, from there. Don't even have shoes on and I nearly fell over. Um, look, I can probably potentially make this available if people want to be able to read those better. I should have put the slides down, but it was just a couple of little tips for people that are responding to domestic and family violence, um, being non-judgmental and just sort of giving them the wording to use, because I think sometimes it's very difficult to, to say the right thing and you don't want to say something to trigger someone. The, um, the Domestic and Family Violence Train the Trainer program has occurred at 29 states safe wide, so that's community, HHSs, 
think there were some PHNs that ran some private hospital sector as well. Um, and the sessions were well received by participants and the evaluations to date show a uh, high level of satisfaction with the toolkit of resources. There was, um, so those things came from a, uh, an email from the, the chair of the expert advisory group. And one of the things that I thought was really profound and that I hope that I contributed to was she said that she would like to acknowledge how vital the involvement of partner agencies has been in achieving the outcomes. And she will endeavour to maintain those important relationships through the establishment of a domestic and family violence network in the future. So, you know, it was really important to sit there and say, you can't just respond here and send someone out. You need to have the community involved. We need to wrap around that care. So I'm really hoping at that strategic level, that message sort of came through strongly. Well, she says it does, so let's fingers crossed. I did, so there was some feedback. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> it looked fine on my computer. Um, lucky they're not the super important ones. Um, so there were some evaluations that came back. We didn't ask about consumer engagement and the lived experience sharing. So, sorry, I started in the strategic policy unit working on the toolkit of resources and I made recommendations that someone with lived experience should be delivering this training with the HHS staff. Unfortunately, in the evaluation, they didn't ask specifically about my involvement, but there was a couple in the additional feedback section which were complimentary to me. Um, because we can't read those, I also got an email from um, one of the participants and one of the facilitators. So I'll just read those ones out. Um, okay. So this is from one of the participants. For me, what I found helpful was Natasha's reflections about the information, time and support provided to her by a number of health, health and other professionals along her journey actually made a difference. I feel like one of the immense challenges of this type of work, particularly in the acute setting, is that as clinicians, we rarely get to see the long-term impact of our interventions. We so often talk about planting the seeds of change, but sometimes it's hard not to chalk that up to an old wives' tale that never actually happens. Natasha showed some really beautiful reflections about how her contact with various health professionals encouraged her to think differently and potentially, more importantly, encouraged her to feel differently. That what she was experiencing was not normal and that she was worthy of dignity and respect. When I got that email, I was like, yes, yes. It's, I mean, that's one person, but there was another couple of good comments. So, you know, we've got to start the ball rolling somewhere. Um, one of the facilitators was within the same email. She did some legwork for me, getting me some info. She said, generally from verbal feedback provided from participants who attended the training, the outcome of your presence and presentation at the training made clinicians aware of the need to be patient-centred to ensure that they do not allow their own values, beliefs, or triggers to influence responses to people presenting with domestic and family violence. Furthermore, you highlighted the fact that if someone chooses not to end the relationship, it does not mean the end of a therapeutic relationship. The goal is not to make a person leave the relationship, but to ensure that the person has an experience of being validated cared for so that if the time comes when they are ready to leave or seek further support, they can identify a safe place to do this. You also reminded participants to understand the impacts of violence on behaviour and self-esteem, reinforcing the need to be mindful of trauma responses when providing clinical responses. Walking down the street, she's been violently assaulted. 
but the outcome is actually the same for both women presenting at AD as far as injuries go. And so I also I, I feel as a woman, but have the experience of it as a feminist and, and wanting women to be loved and okay in the world, that the use of the word domestic somehow diminishes the level of violence and that violence is violence is violence. And so I want you to talk to what's your feeling on I mean wording is one thing and maybe the consequences of wording, but just is there a difference between a woman who's attacked by a stranger as opposed to, I mean, obviously attacked by your husband, but if the outcome is the same, what's your views on the use of the word domestic violence? Does it still I, I think that the characterisation should remain differentiated. I think that the law needs to catch up. You shouldn't get a warning if you are violent, full stop. The person on the street doesn't necessarily get that warning. It, it's not a civil matter and then goes to a criminal matter. So I think that the law needs to catch up a little bit. We're doing the same with one punch, coward punches, whatever that terminology is. I think any violence should be un falling under the same type of laws, to be quite honest. Um, will I see that in my time? I hope so. I hope so. Do you think that would affect um, for women to read in the violent situations if, if their assaults are taken as seriously as the stranger assault? With laws coming down, do you think that will affect how long they stay in relationships? That's a really subjective question, Josie, I think. Um, because of all of those other factors that I mentioned earlier. Um, but but perhaps if we gave it the same type of, it's not okay, it's not okay. It's just that the law's sitting there going, oh, well, you can do it once and then you get a breach and then this happens. That doesn't happen if you're out assaulting people and then you go and assault someone else, you're gonna end up in jail a lot faster than if you're doing it to your partner and that's like BS. <laughs> I sense it myself, normally I don't. Others know that. So. <laughs> I just had two questions slash comments. One is regarding uh, when a person who is a victim of violence, family or domestic violence, gets to a stage where they are brave enough to show the injury. So it might be a child in a school, for example, who one day decides to not wear trousers but to wear a skirt and let someone see their marks. What will often happen in our society is someone will go to the perpetrator to say, did you do that, instead of going to the victim and saying, do you need help? And that's why family violence has a bigger impact and why it then is perpetrated because as soon as they go home, I'll give you marks to show them and they get a damn sight bigger hiding. I think the second part that we need to look at around that is that when we talk about family domestic violence, there's so much guilt attached to it by the maternal person. So whether it's the mother who didn't leave a relationship because the children were being abused and the children for generations will blame that mother but don't understand the guilt that she was holding because exactly as you said before, they're in that relationship because they entered it as a loving relationship and they believe they failed in achieving that. We all know the psychology behind that isn't strong, but it's the psychology that the victim holds and where they're trying to go back to. And I think as clinicians in the health sector, if we understand those dynamics, then we do understand why domestic violence is so different to sexual assault in the street, because it has all of these huge layers that we have to peel away and we have to support the victim as they progress through those layers to a place where they're strong enough to say, hold my hand, I want to get out. I don't have anything to add to that. Thank you. <laughs> no, but absolutely spot on. And I'm, um, yeah, I'm clearly not a clinician and I bring, you know, my expertise, but I think the collaboration of the two is where that, where that strength is and where we can make that change. Oh, this is my conflicting feedback. So this was from the same site. Yeah, I didn't say which site it was, that's good. And I just wanted uh, everyone in the room to kind of reflect on, reflect on this a little bit. Um, having a consumer talk about their lived experience was excellent. I think we all learn so much more when you understand why and who is gonna benefit from the training versus I feel that having Natasha present in throughout the day was detrimental as I felt I could not speak freely. And I really ruminated on that bottom one. When there was, let's say, 20 people in that room and we go with the one in four statistic, did this person think five of my colleagues are probably experiencing this? Was my math right then? Like four, 20? Yeah. Um, I mean, but the, the, like, hello. 
we're gone. Um, <laughs> but, but that was really profound for me. That, that bottom part was so profound. And I was quite explicit in my disclosure. I'm quite open, quite transparent. I'm here as a tool for you guys to utilise. Like, ask me those questions. Ask me the hard questions. Um, so I just, I just thought maybe I can... Yeah, I was going to throw out, so yes? Just a question with the fact that um, mental health is now going into domestic violence. Um, I guess I look at it as it can be an accident and it can also be negative. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? On DV coming into the mental health space as well. So you can basically, if you can be charged as well, um, if you have a mental health condition, to be putting domestic violence into your family. So from the same end, or I'm actually on a steering committee that's having a look at violence in general with um, mental health patients, consumers. Um, and, and it is a side note that I raise, obviously. Um, there's the... You know, we, we talked about those layers just before. But I think it's quite... Look at it. <laughs> it's a personal one for me too. So um, I think it needs to happen. I don't. I, I don't want to stigmatise. Not everyone with mental health conditions are domestically violent towards their partners. Um, I think that there is a need for change, and I am embracing the fact that we're looking at mental illness and domestic violence and violence being contributing factors to that family dynamic and then families supporting those people. And that's, you know, another one of those barriers spoken about before because you feel like I need to be there to help them. They don't understand what they're doing, but you're putting yourself at risk. So it's, it's really about those those two concepts sort of merging together and figuring out the safest strategy for the family if you're choosing to support someone that may be violent. Um, that probably brings in other agencies as well that could potentially support that. Um, but it, I think it's a good move, in short. Yeah? I think I need to... The first thing you need to know, brought up in the same place to be when my mum was really sick and I was brought up with domestic violence, emotional and physical abuse for about eight or nine years. My mum eventually got sorely late. Like, but Natasha, I'm so proud of you. Thank you're, you for all. No, you probably will because <laughs> you're a daughter of Queensland, you're a daughter of Australia. And as a male, as a dad, as a husband, I I want to say sorry to you that you ever suffered this, okay? It is not good enough, and dads in this country have not actually stood up and actually set the example that they should have done to grow their sons so that this does not happen. So from the bottom of my heart, I see a courageous young woman. You're special, you're worthy, you're full of dignity. Sorry. You're not supposed to turn it around on me like that. <laughs> oh, and we're back. Excellent. How do I segue now? I'll just, let's see if everyone, thank you. I don't I feel like I'm lost for words now, but I, I shall try and find some. Can we read these ones? Are they big enough? So I sent out, I did up a little survey monkey thing and I sent it out to all the facilitators. Um, and I just sort of wanted to know the answers to these questions from a, from a clinical point of view. So, what do you believe the value is to domestic and family violence survivors sharing their lived experience during training? Do I need to read these or can everyone read them if I read the titles? Is that going to be... Are we cool with that? Thumbs up, thumbs down, yeah? Sweet, awesome. Can someone nod when you finish reading so I know when to click? Yeah, 
everyone not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Did survivor stories complement the academic process of training and why? Has the delivery of domestic and family violence training, specifically the survivor stories, impacted the way your service will engage with potential victims and survivors, and how? So this one, I found particularly thought-provoking also. I know that I'm that one little seed and I'm that one little voice up against a really huge, I don't even know what to call them. Do you think the, the size of the facility uh, lessens the impact that you can have on that sort of thing? small hospital compared to a large hospital, the large hospital? I would be reluctant to stereotype HHS is that way um, because I think it really, come, it really comes down to the people that you're engaging with and, and how people feel about those social issues and embedding those within, within the practice. So I think um, if within a HHS you have some champions that are pushing it, then you know it'll have a little bit more impact. But if people aren't interested or they're not not engaged with it, then, then perhaps that's a, a bit of a barrier, yeah. It can also be linked to what happens around it provides support. If you go to a very small facility in a remote town, there's nowhere to put that person, and then you go to the police involved in the town, it's not going to be about the size of the facility as much as what resources are out there further. Absolutely, thank you for adding that. Along with everyone knows what's going on in a small town, there's a huge violation. Yeah, so I could definitely not have spoken about rural and remote and, and what that would mean for them. Um, we did touch on the ATSI communities and women having to, or Aboriginal communities and women having to be fully moved to new communities. So I can't, I can't speak to that. I haven't had to do that. But knowing how I felt about my experience, adding that additional layer would have been, yeah, just a, that little bit more difficult as well. Okay, so I just wrapped up. Oh, these are the couple of outcomes, and I tried to be quite broad across Queensland and on a HHS level, um, and these are the particular outcomes that stood out to me from a consumer and person-centred care approach. Um, so I, I mentioned before, I advocated for in the guideline that a person with lived experience should be sharing at that training. Um, I had to de-identify a little bit, but I've heard one of the CEOs has put a blanket, all staff must do the online training. That was a win for me. I hope that rolls out everywhere. I hope this CEO's got some pull across the rest, but um, we'll just have to wait and see for that. Um, there are a number of HHSs that had real-time lived experience sharing, so there were some barriers to engagement with that, um, with finding people. Is that still working? Ooh. Um, finding people. Um, we had some, uh, so the local DVF services came in and did some co-presenting as well, so that's my sort of second option. If you can't have someone with lived experience, get the service in. Um, oh, here it is. Now that there's been connection with the community services, there is more accessibility with people with lived experience. So those community services are the conduit they can bring in people with lived experience so that they can share their stories. I mean, it's been quite a cathartic experience for me over the last couple of years. Um, but that's, that's part of my journey and part of my healing. So um, approximately 400 staff statewide have completed the train the trainer model. So the train the trainer model is the facilities that's then been filtered down and they've delivered the training on the ground as well. I don't have that number. But, you know, it's more than 400. So when, uh, when we were doing the call out to invite people to come to the training, 
we invited the ambulance service, the PHNs, College of Midwives checkup, so that's the GPs if people aren't familiar, and other services. Um, private hospital, RANS, Australia, New Zealand, something, College of Gynecologists, Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Thanks, Joe, I should have looked at you. I knew you'd know that one. And the Royal Flying Doctors. So hearing about the Royal Flying Doctors this morning as well, and um, this morning, last night, last night, and this morning, <laughs> you know, it, it's not something that I would have involvement with living in, with living in the city, but it, it was it, hearing about their involvement and what they've done, like the Flying Doctors, knowing that I had someone that I presented to from the Flying Doctors and that message was getting out to there and that they had that knowledge, um, like that was sort of a nice connection for me to, to, to hear that they do great things and, and that I've been able to add to that. Um, so at one of the HHSs, I, um, on the lunch break, someone from the maternity antenatal section, um, normally when, you, when you're going through that process, it's a you need to fill out this form situation. And when I was having my youngest daughter, it's a bit of a trigger for me. Here, fill this in. It's just a tick and flick exercise. And that wasn't, I didn't, I was having a baby. I didn't want to think about my past trauma of domestic and family violence. And that was just, so just being mindful of sometimes even those psychological assessment tools. It's not, it's not a tick and flick for people. Like this can be a trigger for someone that they have to think about their mental health or they have to, you've just brought up their domestic and family violence. So the fact that she came and said, I'm not going to slide that form across to people anymore. I'm going to be really considerate and mindful of how I engage with people, even doing that screening tool. Um, at one of our uh, emergency departments, it's not mandatory, unfortunately, but it's highly recommended that the ED nurses are doing that training. Um, service improvement strategies are being looked at with domestic and family violence. Um, the private facilitators, um, I liaised with a couple of those when they had to deliver their training and just gave them snippets of my story that they were, were able to integrate into their delivery. Um, I think that sort of, you know, it ties in as well. The experience of me sharing with the facilitators um, so when I'm not in attendance, it adds the local value. So there's lots of international videos that are played throughout the training, but being able to tie that to the, to the local connection um, made an impact for those facilitators. Oh, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Rebecca, are you going to embarrass me? <laughs> with QPS, it comes down to a legal thing as well. You can see the bruises, you can't prove the emotional abuse so much. So that's why it's... And women are often told to document the, the emotional and psychological abuse. So where do you do that in a, in a manner that's safe, that the perpetrator won't find it and find that evidence? Um, so I think there is barriers as well when it comes to that emotional abuse because it, it, it's not so transparent. I don't have the answer to resolve it, though, apart from change the laws. <laughs>